All right, so today uh, I don't have anything new. I want it to be a day of just working on this Grissom sheet that I'm pointing at. I don't know why I'm pointing at this board because it's not actually up here. But on the, the next page, if you flip to the next thing in the book, it's a bunch of Grissom High School. We used to go to this tournament up in Huntsville a lot until they started scheduling it like Easter weekend. It's like, what are you guys doing? And nobody, or they scheduled during our spring break because maybe theirs is different sometimes. So just bizarre, but anyway, and sometimes they schedule it like the end of April. And at that point, everybody's just kind of done. But anyway, um, we used to go up there and have a kickball tournament. And um, it's really, y'all have never played kickball with us. We usually play my kids versus Homer's kids. And we normally beat them down. We actually had a trophy. Y'all seen the trophy? The one with my head? Beautiful. Y'all seen this? Yes. You haven't seen it. This is guy who used to be a computer guy here. And he's got Mr. Helmers on one side. Let the camera see it. So it's got like Mr. Helmers' face on one side. Is that not remarkable? He scanned us in there and then me on the other. Is that not great? So the winner says uh, Hurry versus Helmers annual kickball game. So we used to play kickball there. And um, I think I've only lost once. Maybe twice. Maybe it's twice. Um, one year, Helmers had a team that was so bad. I mean, so bad. In kickball, they got one guy on base. We played for like an hour and a half. One guy on base. They were so bad. Um, and probably the funniest play in the history of kickball occurred. Helmers normally pitches or rolls, whatever you call it. But this game, he decided to play like short fielder. So he's out there, and this is, he says I can share this, so he goes, it's too funny not to share. So Helmers, I don't know if you've ever, like, as a kid, been, like, hauling butt across a field, and it makes a little dip in the ground, and then, so you're run, kind of running slightly down the hill, and then it dips up, you know what I'm talking about? And your legs go out from under you. So this kickball field sloped downward a little bit, and this is, somebody kicked a bomb, I don't remember who it was, and he's running down this sloped little hill and the ground moves up on him and he just eats it. <laughs> so we are just like rolling, laughing, cause he's like getting up, you know, and, uh, you know, kind of disheveled. And he, well, this other kid, Chris something, I forget, goes running back there to get the ball. And Helmers gets up and he's looking like back in on the, on the game. And this guy just hums the ball in. <laughs> and right as he throws it, Helmers, somebody goes, Helmers, and he goes, he turns around right in the face and it hits him in the face and knocks him down to the ground. So at this point, we can't even breathe. But, um, but that was how, but this one team was so bad. It was like 26 to zero. It was just a slaughtering. Well, I inherited that group that was freshmen. My sophomore year, we were able to slightly overcome. Cause I mean, I'm not kidding. When those kids got up, it was like four innings of outs. I mean, they could barely kick it past the pitcher. It was unbelievable. And then, so I barely overcame that deficit my, when they were sophomores. But then when they were juniors and seniors, it was just terrible. So we lost those two years. But actually, that team lost. No, maybe we lost their sophomore and junior year, and then their senior year, they didn't come any tournaments. Maybe that's what it was. They were like the only team in the history of kickball to never win. They were just so rotten. But really enthusiastic. Like, they'd be getting beat 26 to nothing, and they'd get that third out, and you'd see them, they'd come running in. And they'd be so excited, and they'd get up there, out, out, out. And walk back to the outfield. But that play was truly amazing. But anyway, that was Grissom, and that's the worksheet I have for you. So it's on page 6970, and is it four pages, maybe? Yeah, through 72. So there's a bunch of them right now, but I want you to get that out right now and scan it. Because I want to put a video up for, to have something up for those guys. So scan through it, and if you see something and you're like, oh, I think I can do it, I think I can do it. If you don't think you can do it, let's take a look real quickly. What, All right. What year was that game? Like what? Oh, oh gosh. Uh, Y'all remember Kate Schiller? This was her, her brother, Chris Schiller, was in that group. Um, so if you can find him, I'm guessing he's probably 20, and there are a lot of Schillers. He's probably 26, so he would have been 15, 14 as a freshman. 
so maybe 12 years ago, so maybe 2008-ish, probably somewhere around in there. I could probably go look and find him, but probably somewhere around in here, maybe, maybe in here. Yeah, I don't know exactly. He may be older than that. It's been a while. But anyway, they were really fun, but they were terrible kickball players. I mean, they were, but they were all in. Like, sometimes when you're a terrible kickball player, you know you are, and you're like, I'm not playing. And you go and they play on the swings or do something else. But this group was all in, man. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, I'd roll it, pop up to the pitcher. I'm like, every time, pop up to the pitcher. Pop up to the pitcher. I couldn't, couldn't get out of the infield. So anyway, it was pretty fun playing kickball, but those few years were like, uh. um, so anyway, I'm pulling it up right here. What do we got? I don't know if you've seen this new discovery. Can I show you this? I have. And you can just click. Check this out. Bam! Isn't that cool? That's so cool. What do you think? Anybody, you're looking at any that you're struggling with? What's a palindrome again? Y'all remember what a palindrome is? Same way both ways. So a palindromic prime would be a prime number that reads forwards or backwards. All right, so like 131 would be a palindromic number. I don't know if it's prime, I haven't checked it. Or 5225 or 63636 or 74447. Something if you flipped it around the other way. So it's a prime number, but it's, what is the next term in that sequence? So it's gotta be prime. So think about palindromes. What are the ne what's the next palindrome? That you could turn it either way. Two two, but that's not prime. Three three, that's not prime. Four four five five, any of those aren't prime because that'll have an eleven in them, right? So that gets you all the way to ninety nine. Now you get to three digit numbers. So what about three digit numbers? One oh one oh one. Is that prime? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's not. No, no. It might be. It's really kind of a dumb problem. It's not one one one. It's either one oh one or one thirty one. I don't you just have to go in there and check all the is it one oh one? Okay. But that's what they're that's what they're doing here. It's kind of a dumb question, but I was just comp doing a compilation of little sequence problems and how you might see them. Look through there. Anything you want to talk about? Because this is your homework, classwork. Yeah. The number two is zero. That's one It is. So this one looks uglier than it is. What do you end up with here? What's ten factorial over nine factorial? Just ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one factorial is not zero. It's one. So I'm just adding you to add the num asking you to add numbers between ten and one. Could, you could literally add them or you could use your sum formula. There's 10 terms. First term is a 10, last term is a one, right? Five times 11. What else, just flipping through those. Cause you're gonna have to do them. A couple of, there might be some quadratics in here. I don't, I'm not sure. There are, I mean, I'll, I'll look in a second. If there are, we'll skip those because. Some of these are ugly. Probably never, probably never give you some of these on a test. Like if you look at a, I just kind of want you to start learning from them. But I thought, what number was it? Number 14. It's kind of gross, but kind of interesting. And a lot of these look much harder than they are if you just give them a shot. Anybody looking through here? Right now my video is pretty bad. Oh, you can, uh, you can skip number 21. 21 requires you to use those formulas. 
on that, uh, all those formulas I had up there on the right. Um, it wasn't the quadratic stuff, but it was all the sigma with the squares and the cubes, all that kind of stuff that I put in the video a couple days ago. We're not going to do that this year. It's, it just requires you to have to memorize those things, and the fact that we didn't spend all this time doing summer reading kind of takes that out of play. By the way, at the end of this uh, document, I have um, all the solutions. You can see those. Nobody has any questions? Just looking ahead. Nobody, huh? Num number 12. Just making that up? Or'd you actually look? <laughs> says find I don't know what Fibonacci sequence is. Okay, that's worth knowing because it's been on my test before. Fibonacci, Leonardo Fibonacci, was uh, actually did a, uh, did a study for the king on population growth of rabbits. He grew up in like, I want to say it was Pisa, Italy or something like that. But um, he noticed that, and I can kind of show you See what's going on? It's essentially a uh, a recursive sequence. And you know how all the sequence formulas you have right now, they define terms in terms of their places. So you'll have a T, and then you got a bunch of numbers with an N in there, right? So if you want the 50th term, you just plug in 50 for N. And that's how you find a certain term, right? But a recursive sequence doesn't define a term in terms of its place. It defines a term in terms of other terms. So like for instance, you can see here that the third term is basically the first term plus the second term. Right? You can see that the fifth term is basically the third term plus the fourth term. So Fibonacci sequence basically says the nth term is the what? T to the n minus 2 and T to the n minus 1. So to find any term, you got to take the term two places before it and one place before it and add them together. So it makes it really hard to go and find the 100th term. It makes it a little difficult. But that particular problem you just asked me about, number 12, you got to create some patterns. And I imagine there are some people in this earth that know these patterns already, but I didn't until I started playing with it. So it said the nth term of Fibonacci sequence, find it if the sum of the first nth terms is 376. So I kind of started noticing something here. I'm going to rewrite this a little less. Okay, so if you start looking at this, the sum of the first four terms is what? Sum of the four terms is seven. Okay. What's the sum of the five terms? Twelve. So the sum of the five, first five terms is twelve. What's the sum of the first six terms? Twenty. Okay, now look at these numbers. Seven is one less than that, 12 is one less than that, 20 is one less than that. So if I think about it, if the sum of the first n terms is 376, if you think about it, that seven right here points to two terms further. This 12 points to, right, of these numbers right here, points to two terms further. This 20 points to two terms further. So if I know that the sum of the first six terms is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the eighth term minus one, I've kind of got a relationship there, don't I? Yes? So if the sum of the n terms, 
since the sum of the first n terms is 376, if I add 1 to that, I get what? Y'all see it? I get the n plus second term, but it wants the n term. Now answer a question for me, and I do it with just this. So I want I want that. I'm just going to throw it out there. See if you can think about it. Don't just let it compete. See if you can think about it. You might have to write a few more out. Maybe on it. By the way, these numbers get really bigger. So if you just want to write some of them out, you'll see. Alright, because this is already going to go 55, 89. I mean, they're going to get really large really quickly. But that's the idea of all it. Does that make any sense? That's just pattern recognition that I've noticed. And I'm looking for this. I know that. So I'm looking for this term before that, the TN, a couple spaces before. Anyway, what else? Before Anderson just picks another random number. I mean, it kind of works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it says, this is a little tricky because you guys don't know much about base numbers. I'm guessing. You might have done a little bit in like seventh grade or whatever math class where you did different bases, but you all understand the idea of base numbers? Like if I have a base five, how does base five count? 144. Right? A base number, how does it work? Like base 10 means this. Like if I have 13 in base 10, Basically, I, in base 10, I count 1, 2, 3, all the way through 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. But do you know that in base 10, what that means is you have 1, 10, and 3 ones. I don't know if you knew that. Like if I had 127 in base 10, you have 1, 10 squared, 1, 100, two tens, 20, and seven ones. Now the ones, you can quit writing 10 to the zero if you want, because I get tired of doing that too. Well, what that would mean in base eight then, sorry, in base eight, what do you think this means? I have one, what? Eight squared plus two eights plus seven. So technically, this number in base 10 would be 64 plus 16 plus seven, 87 in base 10. Like for, this is a dumb math nerd joke, but it's like, um, there's two kinds of people in this world. No, there's 10 kinds of people in this world. Those who understand binary code and those who don't. <laughs> Because binary code is base two. So if there's 10 kinds of people in this world, you have one, two, and zero ones. So math dorky humor, they make t-shirts of that. I saw another Calvin and Hobbes, it might be on one of your, uh, it's on somebody's review packet as a comic, it might be Calculus, I don't know, maybe yours. But it, yeah, it goes, I thought I told you to do 100 push-ups. You only did four. And he goes, let me explain to you the concept of uh, base, um, base four. No, was it base four or base two? Base four. So he has, no, base two. So that's one, two squared, plus zero twos, plus zero. So... He said, do 100 push-ups, and he goes, oh, I did, in base two. So he did four. Again, dumb humor, math humor, good stuff. 
But anyway, because it's base eight, you have to think base eight. So let me ask you a question. If I gave you 0.152 repeating, how would you write it based on your base 10 knowledge? What is our trick for changing that to a fraction if it's a repeating decimal? 152 over 999. Over 999? And you've, you learned that a long time ago, right? Well, in base 10, that's what you do. But in base 8, what do you think you do? Out of recognition, what do you think you do? 152 over 777. It says simplify it. So now that I've converted it to a base 10 mentality, um, is there any way any of that cancels? You wrote 157. Sorry, 152. Anything cancel there? Um, I don't think so, because that just has a 7 and a 111. And the 111 has got a 3 and a 37 and a 7. None of that goes, none of that goes into that. So it says find the sum of the numerator and the denominator. But it says write that back in base 8. Now that's the part that's tricky. When you write that back in base 8, have you all ever learned how to do that? Like, I'll give you an example. If I give you something like 25 that's in base 10, and I want to know what is that in base 8, you have to think to yourself, okay, base 8's asking, if it's base 8, I want to know how many 1's, how many eights and how many eight squares are in there? How many eight squares? How many 64s are in there? None. How many eights are in there? Three. So take out the eights. So that 25 base 10 would be 31 base 8. Does that make sense? Because think about it. I have 3 times 8, which is 24 plus one. Because this no longer means three tens and a one, which is normal 31, right? Like two tens and a five. It's three eights and a one. But with that in mind, how would this work? In base eight, how many ones, how many eights, how many eight squares? How many eight squares? How many 64s are in there? What do we get? 56. So I have 14, actually, 8 cubes. Yeah. How many 8 cubes? 8 cubes is 512. How many 512s do you have in there? And by the way, if you want to pick the biggest number, like you just so I, I was not anticipating that. And if, if you can put that 8 cubed as a 512, uh, 8 to the fourth would be a 4096. So 4096 would go in there, do that. If it doesn't, then go to 512. 8 cubed, if that, and it does, so I'm going to subtract off a of 512, gives me a 417. Now, how many 64s go into 417? 6, right? How many 8s go into 33? 4s with 1 left over? Why is that an option unless I didn't simplify correctly? 152 over 777, is that simplifying? I didn't see it. When you get that 152 over 777, is that in base 8 or is that in base 2? Maybe that's in base 8. Um, oh, you know what I did? I know what I did. Sorry. Everything I showed you was good here, but this part was wrong. 152 over 777, and it says find the sum of them in base 8. Dang it, why am I doing that? Um, 
when I find the sum of them, here's where I went wrong. I said nine, 12, nine, two, nine, or whatever I said. When you add in base uh, eight, you don't have eights. Like in base 10, you don't have tens. You have ones through nine, zeros through nines. It looks like a 10, but it's really a one with a zero. Well, when you count in base eight, you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, oh. Standing for the one, eight, and the zero ones. All right, so you literally, it looks like you're going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Are you following me? You never hit an eight because this stands for one eight and no ones. One eight, so that's like your eight. That's like your nine, one eight and one one. This is like your 10, one eight and two ones. So when I add these, I get two and seven. I don't get nine. That was my mistake. There is no nine. What is nine? One one, one eight and one one. That gives you what, 12, 13? Wait. There is no 13. What is 13? 13 is 1, 8, and what? 5 ones? 9? There is no 9. What is a 9? 1, 8, and 1, 1? So we were able to keep it in base 8 the whole time. We didn't have to convert it. I made the mistake of adding it. We really didn't have to do all that junk with the 929. We could just go, it's, we, it stayed in base eight. We had it, we had it. But that other stuff I showed you was a, was a way to turn from base 10 to base, to another base. And the problem is, you're like, why do you have to do all this? Why do you have to use base 10 at all? In this case, you really didn't have to, but we, we don't know how to add in base eight. We weren't trained that way, right? I mean, if I say, what's seven plus eight, you're gonna say 15. You're not gonna say, what is that? Six or uh, whatever. It's one seven. One seven would be base eight. One eight and one seven would be R15. So we're trained in base 10. So you have to add the way you're trained, nine, and then go, wait, nine is one eight and one one. One one carry the eight. So you're not carrying the one like you're carrying a 10. You're carrying the one like you're carrying an eight. So it's kind of a weird way of thinking. Did that make any sense? I'll do another one, just a random one. Like if I told you to add 495 and 728, and these are base seven numbers. So when you add five and eight, your base, base 10 brain gives you 13, right? But we're not adding in base 10, we're adding in base seven. So what is 13 in base seven? Well, how many sevens do you have in there? With how many left over? Six? So 16 is what you got. And then when you add that together, I get 12, right? But our, we're adding in base 10. I have to think and write it in base seven. So how many sevens are in there? One with five left over. And that 12, we got 12 again, so. So that's how you would add and keep it in base seven, but you can't help yourself but to add in base 10 and convert each and every time you do it. It's even ugly with multiplication because you get much bigger numbers. If I were to ask you to multiply this sucker, I mean, it just gets really bad, right? Eight times five is 40. Oh, crap. 40 is really what? Because I multiplied in base 10 and I wasn't supposed to. How many sevens are in that? Five with what? Five left over. Eight times nine is 72. Crap. How many sevens are in that? Well, I can go higher. How many 49s are in that? Right? Right? How many, that's how many 49s. How many sevens are in that? Three with two left over. I mean, it really starts getting ugly when you start doing the multiplication, right? All right, if you're struggling staying awake, I have found that when you fold your arms and lean back, you're in like prime resting position. Just saying, just learned this over the years. I told you my go to sleep story, haven't I? College. The sleep box, right? 
The what? The sleep monster, right? No. Yes. I told y'all that? Are y'all in that class? No, please enlighten us. And you're asleep. <laughs> um, no, I sat right there in this class. And um, it's a 7.30 a.m. class. Don't ever take a 7.30 a.m. class in the winter. It's the worst because it's freezing cold. You're bundled all up. You get to class. It's like the heater's on 77 or whatever. And you're like, uh, and you're still tired. And I didn't drink coffee at the time. So I was like, just sleeping. I was right there. And you know how when you start to go to sleep? Like, tell me if this happened. If you start to go to sleep, but you think your eyes are open, because you're playing this like mental video of the class and you have no idea as your eyes are shut, right? Until it's like somebody bumps you or something like that. And you're like, what the heck? You know what I'm talking about? Everybody's probably experienced that. Well, I started to do that and I didn't know it. But all of a sudden, something just touched the tip of my nose. I'm like, who's touching my face? Because it really did feel like somebody just went, unk. And I had just slowly gone over <clears throat> and just hit the desk. It was right there. Like, this teacher was teaching his class on research papers. And I'm just like the leaning tower of Pisa, just dropping over. And at the end of the period, I was walking up. She goes, it's not that bad, is it? I was like, oh, so sorry. Anyway, I feel your pain if you're tired. I've been there. What else? Anything else? A lot of these problems are kind of unique in that they incorporate other weird things. If you're thinking about this, why in the heck is this the sequence? Um, I probably put it on there because I don't know if you know this, but like repeating decimals, like one, two, one, two, one, two, repeating decimals can be thought of. You tell me, isn't this 0.12 plus 0.0012 plus 0.000012 forever? So isn't this 12 over 100 plus 12 over 10,000 plus 12 over, is that right, 100? So what kind of sequence is this? It's geometric, right? And if it's geometric, couldn't you say, oh, if it goes forever, that is the first term over one minus the ratio, and what does it look like I'm multiplying by? 100. One over 100, right? 100 on the bottom. So there's your infinite sum. So I can find that value this way, multiply the top and the bottom by 100. Oh, 12 is 99. But you knew that already, right? 0.12 is 99. But it's an infinite geometric sequence, so that's probably why I have this here. But, um, so I guess, in theory, you could have written this as 0 0.152 plus 0 0.00152 plus 0.00000152. I thought about each one of these as 152 over 888 plus 152 over 888 000. And you could have done an infinite geometric sequence, but it's probably easier to just think in terms of knowing that little pattern, that if it's a repeating decimal, you can just jump to not over 99, but over one less, 77, and get there. But uh, what else? Number four, harmonic sequences. Next term in the harmonic, what do you know about harmonic? If it's harmonic, what has to happen? If you set it up where they have common numerators, the denominators would be arithmetic. And if the denominators are arithmetic, then you can see the pattern. So right here, common numerator would just be all fours. So four on the top and the bottom, that already has a four. Two on the top and the bottom, this one already has a four. And you can see plus three, plus three, plus three. So the next term, that's a, that'd be a test question on my test or something like that. So it probably wouldn't be that, this is pretty nice because it didn't take much to change all those. It was pretty easy what the common numerator would be. But I think they were trying to mess with you because it kind of looked like maybe there was some pattern on the top or whatever. So I would think a lot of people guess this 211 so this 419 since so they didn't know what they were doing. Thinking there was some pattern maybe in that. 
know, maybe not one. What else? Anything you see that's troublesome? There's another harmonic problem, number seven. What is number eight? Y'all see it? I walk 37 miles to school every day in the snow at three miles an hour. I walk 37 miles home in the middle of the snow at seven miles an hour. What is my average speed for the day? What is irrelevant here? Well, it's semi-irrelevant, but it doesn't go into the math. <laughs> yes, that is true. The what? The miles. But the, the, index, the fact that you're going the same distance each way is important. So it doesn't actually go into the math, but that tells you that what's the relationship here of an average rate? What do you know about the average rate in a situation where the distances of each rate are the same? Yeah. Uh, look, divided by two. What are you doing? <laughs> That's if the time spent is the same. So like if I drive for 50 miles, if I walk for three miles an hour for an hour, and then seven miles an hour for an hour, and the time spent walking is the same, then it's an arithmetic mean, you just add them together and divide by two. But if the distances are the same, then the time spent is gonna be different because I went faster on one than the other. So I completed the task more quickly. That is not an arithmetic mean when you add them together, although most people think that, which is why most people guess, they didn't even have four as an option. They should have, because a lot of suckers would have grabbed them. Say it louder. Oh, yes, what did I say, four? Yes, add and divide by two and you get five. And there it is over there in the E, waiting for you. But that's not it. What do you do? Good, Clary, it's, yeah, it's a harmonic mean. It's a harmonic mean of these. So I'm basically saying if that's three and that's seven, what's the harmonic mean? And the shortcut is two times the product over the sum, which should be pretty easy to find. And 21 fifths is four and a fifth. Or you could just do find a common numerator. What would the common numerator be? 21 sevenths, 21 thirds, right? I rewrote them with the common numerator. So this would have to be 21 fifths. And again, four and one fifth. But that's a situation when your rates are the same. I mean, sorry, when the distances traveled are the same, this just happens to happen. And if you don't know why, this is why. Let me think for a second. Isn't this true? Total time is the sum of the two individual times. And if D equals RT, isn't this true also? Time is distance over eight. So shouldn't it make sense if I make substitutions for time with this, that the total time is total distance over average rate, and T1 is first distance over first rate, second distance over second rate. But it just so happens if the distances are the same, then I could say that distance is the same as that distance, and the total distance would be what? Two of those distances. Well, what would happen right here if I multiplied through by one over D? to all three of these. The D's get canceled, don't they? So this would become just a two, this would become a one, that would become a one. And if I know R1 is three, and I know R2 is seven, watch what I would do to find average rate. I'm not gonna do any simplifying. And this is how I came up with that formula. One over three plus one over seven is seven over 21, plus three over 21, or seven plus three over 21. And then if I flip both sides, I get average rate over two is three times seven over seven plus three, and multiply both sides by two. Average rate is two times the product over the sum. But that's only true when your distances are the same. If your distances are not the same, well, then you gotta go and actually use that D over R equation 
and we did those back in algebra two. We don't do a lot of that anymore, but we, this shows up a good bit because it has to do with harmonic means. And that's, this happens to be a harmonic mean situation, so you can do it either one of these ways, two times product over the sum, or find the common numerator, figure out the middle. What else? There's some tough problems on here if you want to just kind of flip through. There's a great problem. I've given this on a test a hundred times. You know, That's probably not true. I've only been here 20, 28 years. Yeah, maybe. Between algebra 2 and geometry. Use your logic. How do you multiply terms that have like bases? Like, how would you multiply those two? Keep the base, add the exponents? Those three. Keep the base, add the exponents? Keep the base, add the exponents? Okay, trust your math. Again, this is a perfect example of assuming the position. You look at this and you're like, I don't know what to do. But if you can do one thing, I know, keep the base, add the exponents. That's what it says to multiply like bases. Oh, so if you just find the infinite sum of the sequence on top and molten. But you didn't see that until you took one step, did you? But the second you took one step and just trusted the process, say, I know how to do something, let me do that one thing, and now it's like, oh, if I would have given you this as a problem, it wouldn't have been a big deal, I know. If I would have started right here. But it's that first step that kind of parts the clouds, lets the sun shine down, right? So how do you find the sum of that? Well, that's what? Infinite geometric. So, first term over one minus the ratio. And what's one half divided by one minus a half? One, two to the first. So a lot easier than it appears to be, but again, you gotta do it. And if you go home tonight and just copy down this work, you get a lot of test questions you haven't learned. Somebody else? Yeah, 14 is pretty ugly. Um, you got three minutes. Let me just kind of give you an idea about 14. The problem with 14 is it says for all real x and y. That means for any number that's real. So avoid imaginaries, anything else. This is true. So anything you want to plug in for x and y, it's true statement. So what I did is I, I thought, well, let me just start really basic. Let me just start with like... All right, what happens when x is zero and y is zero? That tells me that f of zero times f of zero minus f of zero times zero equals zero. Well, that just tells me that f of zero squared, so f of zero, and if I factor that out, f of zero minus one, so this tells me that either f of 0 equals 0 or f of 0 equals 1. I'm not sure yet. And I literally started playing with these. I said, okay. So I wrote these off to the side. I'm not sure what it is. But I'm going to hold that thought. And then I'm going to go, let me change something. Now 0 times 1 is still 0. So that tells me that, what? That if I factor out an f of zero, sorry, now that doesn't tell me that. All of this ends up equaling zero, equaling one. So I thought, okay, if f of zero is zero, zero times that minus zero equals one. Does that make sense? Does zero times this minus zero equal one. This tells me that all that would go away and zero equals one. That's not true. So f of zero equals zero couldn't be true. And I'm getting on plane. What if f of zero is one though? If f of zero is one, f of one is two. Okay, now I'm getting somewhere. If f of zero is one and f of one is two, Got a guess on what f of 1999 is? 2,000, one bigger? 
This is me just randomly playing. You could keep doing these and seeing them. It's not pleasant. Y'all have a great nine-day break. Come back renewed. Bigger.